Hello Serie A fan. Mancini equals Lippi's 25 game run as the Azzurri make the perfect start to their World Cup qualifying campaign. The Azzurrini get more cards than Boaz on his birthday and Inter go under the knife for cosmetic surgery. Meanwhile, three Juventus players get fined for breaching protocol. No Pirlo, no party. On this episode of Scudetto. Hello and welcome to Scudetto and a happy Easter to those of our listeners that celebrate it. It is good to be back and very, very sorry to miss last week's episode in particular. A fascinating interview with former Serie A Primavera player Richard Hughes. If you hadn't, haven't had a chance to listen to that, do go back and check it out. There's loads of good stuff in there. Lovely tribute to his former manager, Cesare Prandelli. Uh, lots of other good insight as well. Just to quickly address this, because we did have a question about where I've been. So just to get that one out of the way, I had the shingles quite nasty. So yeah. Didn't he just playing goal for England, was... Peter Shingles? Huh? <laughs> I was going to say, you're both very professional in it, not saying anything about that on the podcast. <laughs> I was expecting to just have the piss ripped out of me for having an old man's disease. <laughs> I kept saying it was a pirate's disease, but then I kept thinking about scurvy, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know what it was either. Basically, if you have chicken pox, you can just randomly get it when you're an adult. Just reactivates. It's really weird. Uh, makes you really knackered and have a rash. Good anyway, to have you back, Much Oscar. better now. <laughs> yeah, thank Good you. Good to have you back. And um, yeah, definitely enough said about that. So we've got a few things to get through this week. Obviously, we need to catch up on both the Azzurri and the Azzurini. And we're going to talk about the stadiums reopening and obviously some of the weekend fixtures. Uh, plus, it's first episode of the month, so we'll be answering your questions in Ask Scudetto. Boaz, that was a very long intro from me. How, how about you? How are you getting on? I'm doing very well. As we said last week, it was my birthday over the weekend, and uh, I celebrated by breaking some sort of Zoom record by being online for 11 hours. It started with my Australian friends, and uh, it ended with my Australian friends waking up with their coffee the next day, so... 14 countries were involved. Very, I'm a popular guy, apparently. That's a bit of a marathon. Yeah, it was so. a, b- a bit much, but the, the the Negroni's Bagliato and the Spritz definitely helped, kept me greased up well. <laughs> Good stuff. And on that topic, what have you got to keep yourself greased this evening? I'm drinking a Dark Matter Black IPA. I've had it once before. It's lovely. Sounds good. And how about you, Kenny? I know you've got a nice beer this evening. I do. It is a. I'm good. I'm good to to answer the first uh, the first point that you asked. You asked was. I'm doing very well, thanks, Oscar. I'm glad yeah, you're doing better. Does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm. Yeah. I've. Um, I've got a Brewdog Elvis juice, which I've always been told is really really nice, but I've always been a bit scared by the six point five percent tag on the side of it. But I just thought tonight uh, it's a long weekend here in the in the UK, so so let's go for it. Uh, so I've got one of those. Uh, and can I also just take this uh, opportunity to wish a happy Passover to, to Boaz and all of our uh, Jewish friends as well? Toda raba, Kenny. Efoshalat. Yeah, ha- happy Passover, <laughs> Boaz. Terrible. It's a terrible holiday, but let's not get into that. The, f- the food is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I've been struggling to find like a good Easter egg here. Like, uh, is it not a thing in Finland? Like, they do have them, but like, I bought a packet of what I thought looked like mini eggs, but they were licorice in the middle. Not really what I was looking. I'd like licorice, but not what I was looking. For. That Elvis juice is dangerously good. I told yeah, you. Yeah, I was interesting. I was telling you, it's just too nice, and it doesn't taste very strong. You got to be careful. Okay, that's enough about the beers. Let's move on to the football and starting off with the Italian national team who won all three of their World Cup qualifiers. Uh, since we last spoke, they beat Bulgaria 2-0 on Sunday and also beat Lithuania 2-0 on Wednesday. Um, starting off with the Bulgaria game, I thought they were a bit kind of lucky to get the break. I'm not sure about the penalty and they looked like they were struggling a little bit. What did you make of it, Buzz? In this instance, it felt like Italy perhaps didn't shine as much as we've seen them shine in the past, but they got the job done, and uh, perhaps the penalty was a little bit um, a little bit generous from the referee, but uh, there was another penalty in the game that was a stonewall penalty and wasn't given. Uh, obviously, no VAR in these competitions, and suddenly you realize how much we miss it. Just ask Cristiano Ronaldo. In any case, uh, I thought Italy did just enough, 
and um, the chopping and changing of the squad probably didn't help much but nine points and sitting top of the group is pretty good yeah and um, we're discussing that Italy are now 25 games unbeaten under Mancini uh, it's really a sort of dynasty that he's building um, although yet to be really tested what do you make of the way that it's kind of approaching these games yeah, well, I think the the thing is, I, w- I wouldn't actually, for starters, say that they, they haven't been tested. There have been a few uh, difficult games in there. The most recent ones that spring spring to mind are Netherlands and, and Poland. But uh, I, I think the main thing is to just hark back to, to Marcello Lippi's comments, actually. This was actually after the, the most recent uh, game where he said that Italy are playing with a, a real identity and that is almost more important than the you know that this incredible run of results that they've they've strung together and i think that's exactly right what's what's incredible i think that he's managed to achieve is he's really built a squad i mean boaz mentioned there's a lot of chop, chopping and changing there were i think 10 outfield all of the outfield players uh, were changed between the first game uh, that that you mentioned so that the second game in this series of 3 uh, and the the Lithuania game, and they they weren't uh, they weren't convincing. They didn't play quite as sort of free flowing as we're used to seeing the Azzurri under Mancini. But nevertheless, three two nil victories, three clean sheets, sitting top of the group. They can now go into the Euros uh, fully concentrated on that. That's I think I think it can only be a good sign. Uh, it, again. Same old football cliches. The sign of a good team is a team that wins when they're not necessarily playing at their best. Um, but it, it's true, uh, and it's also incredible. I think that he can do this, keep this consistency while we've had players out for various reasons, injury, COVID, etc., um, and still keep up this this run. Uh, it's really exciting times, and I think aside from maybe France, are possibly clear uh, favourites going into the euros italy have to be right up there as uh, one of the other the other big contenders i think along with you know your usual suspects uh, england germany etc and um, a little bit about bulgaria it, even though possibly the the country is now not in a, not a great footballing country like it may have been in the past but it has to be said that italy had never won away in bulgaria they'd only beaten them at home and at usa 94 which is a game that uh, it was a great game and for fans of a certain vintage. Also, uh, I, touching on something that Kenny just said, you know, Holland were destroyed by Turkey. France only managed a draw in one of the games. Macedonia beat Germany. So it feels like um, this tournament especially is very open. And uh, why not Italy? They seem to be one of the few teams who, as Kenny said again, have a clear identity and are playing a style and are, are quite entertaining. So... You know, again, we we said it a few months ago that they they could be dark horses, but I I think this uh, after this qualifying session that's that's been fortified for me. Yeah, it's interesting. You both saying that you think they've got a very strong identity when obviously the personnel, as as we've discussed, has been changed so often. Um, you wonder. Well, they if have a system. May, they have a clear have system, a system, don't they? Um, and they all buy into that. So. Um, to do that yeah. at, at a club level is one thing. To do it at a national level is really quite an achievement, given that these players only meet up what once every two or three months. Yeah, um, and this qualifying group is likely to be decided by the, the two games against Switzerland towards the end of the year. Um, obviously, we'll, we'll have a chance to see them against tougher opposition in the Euros before then. But w- what do we think of their chances? It's, uh, it's re- really important that they win those two games to qualify, really, isn't it? Apparently, the Italy are not. Italy's results in September are usually quite poor, and uh, the the one of the games against Switzerland falls in this period. So hopefully, Italy can buck the trend. But um, I, as I as I think it's quite clear, I I feel quite positive about qualification from this group and also um, the Euro, the upcoming Euro. It feels very strange to be talking about the Euro while we're still qualifying for the World Cup. And again and again, it feels strange to be talking about Euro 2020 when we're past that year. But that's the way it is. Yeah. And if they do, or or the team that comes second in that group, as I I was just looking into this today, goes into a qualifier with the 10 other runners-up and the two qualifiers from the Nations League. So even if they come second in the group, would get another opportunity to qualify for the World Cup. 
Okay, there's probably enough on the Italian national team. We should just mention the COVID outbreak. So, I, and something that we probably should mention is the it's probably the one chink in the armor for Mancini, which is the number nine spot. Um, in this uh, qualification round, Belotti and Immobile shared the the role and both got on the score sheet, which is, is quite a positive thing. But at the same time, um, Immobile missed a lot of chances and uh, probably was one of the poorest performers against Lithuania. And uh, as I think Italy really lack an out-and-out scorer, someone who can be relied on to hold the ball up. Yeah, I mean, they both got on the score sheet from the penalty spot as well, didn't they? I feel like Belotti had that incredible effort that came off the the, the post as well, the, the lob. Um, so, yeah, Belotti probably possibly slightly less at fault although the the flip side to that is that Immobile got into more goal scoring opportunities but yeah uh, Immobile this this thing this thing of him not being able to do what he does at club level at national team that theme just like keeps keeps running really so that's a that's for me that's probably the only real issue that they've still got to address um, because they can't afford to miss the chances that Immobile missed uh, in the in the Euros when they're coming up against big teams. You get like a handful of chances in some of these games and you need to be absolutely ruthless. And Immobile at club level is that man. Immobile for Italy at the moment isn't. Yeah, can't be relying on being gifted soft penalties when it comes to, comes to the big games. Um, yeah, so just as I was saying before, we should quickly discuss the COVID outbreak. I think we're four members of uh, the national team staff tested positive for COVID um, since getting back to Juventus. Bonucci is also tested positive. Uh, what do we think the sort of ramifications for Serie A are going to be? Well, it'll be it'll be interesting. I know we're going to, to touch on the Roma Sassuolo game soon, but I think Sassuolo have also uh, have also taken the initiative and decided. Uh, to essentially self-isolate the four players that have come back from the national team. Juventus, the latest I read, have taken a different line. They're basically just going to test them, and so long as they clear those those tests, they'll be they'll be good to play. Uh, but yeah, it is one of the challenges of of the time. You just got to kind of roll with the the punches. This is not new. We have had people coming back from international breaks before with this and if you have to play your you know your suboptimal starting 11 if you even have to uh, go into the the youth team to to pick out some some rising stars then so be it uh, obviously with the exception being if it, if there does prove to be an outbreak at uh, at a club and that's another theme that we're going to come to obviously uh, <laughs> later on but yeah, the, the ramifications are that you've just kind of got to get on with it unless circumstances dictate that you've got to do the exact opposite. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. that that's life at the moment, isn't it? It's not just football. Absolutely. Um, and as far as we know, all of the fixtures are going ahead this weekend as of recording on the Thursday evening. Um, so I guess we have to wait and see. Uh, Baz, I very much enjoyed your update last week on the uh, Italian national teams under 21s. And I believe you have more for us. Have they been? Have they been getting on? So it was um, kind of touch and go until the final game of the qualification. The last time we recorded, Italy had just drawn one-one with the Czech Republic with two sending offs and Tonali managing to get a free match suspension. On top of that, the next game was against Spain, where again Italy saw two red cards, and you're starting to think, is there a pattern here? There was some choice words. Uh, exchanged between the Spain under-21 manager and uh, Italy's under-21 manager. W- one of the best lines was the, the Italy under-21 manager said that Spain were so used to scoring in consecutive games that the first game they drew, they didn't score, they lost their heads. But in any case, Italy came good in the last qualifying game and uh, got one by convincing 4-1 against, 4-0 against Slovenia with uh, Kutone getting two goals, one of which was a bit of a worldie. I recommend you guys check it out. And this result uh, guaranteed qualification, although Spain qualified first, Italy will face Portugal in the next phase of this tournament because this is a COVID tournament and therefore it's split over a few months for some reason. But um, I think I'm going to take the occasion and give a dishonorable mention to uh, Marquisa, who was one of the players who got sent off in that first game. The genius came on in the 54th minute in this game. And, and managed to get sent off in the 82nd minute for two yellow cards and obviously he'll miss the game against Portugal 
And you have to wonder, most people didn't even know who Marquisa was a few months ago, and now he's got, sent, got himself in the, <laughs> in the headlines twice. Made the name for himself. Yeah, five red cards in three games. Really impressive disciplinary record, yeah, it's, isn't it? Uh, it's top level shit housery. It's uh, congrats. We should start like a new award. I don't know what would it be. The uh, Gattuso Award for uh, lack of discipline. Maybe Materazzi. <laughs> Materazzi. Mm. Yeah. Um, or the Graham Sunes Award. The Pablo Montero Bone Breaker Award. Yeah. Good stuff. There's some issues in the Juventus camp just being reported today that several of their players were at a party that was stopped by the police at Western McKenney's house. Not sure exactly how many people were there. We've heard between 10 and 20. Also, Paolo de Bala, Artur, those were the three that were reported. Yeah, as I said, police shut it down. It looks like Juventus are going to find them. Just, like, stupid, really, isn't it? We, we've discussed players breaking these rules many times. Yeah, I mean, it is stupid. First and foremost, it's stupid, and I... Um... Always the first one to jump on my high horse about these things and go on about pandemics and everything. Um, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, a stupid thing to do. Paolo Di Bella has actually uh, unreservedly apologised while claiming that it wasn't a party. He said, we out for dinner. Uh, but nevertheless, they breached lockdown rules. So absolutely stupid uh, thinking that, that sort of the rules don't apply to them because they're, you know, superstars. Uh, but the other thing that I think is kind of interesting is if it, if if that's right, what Paolo Di Bella is saying, we went for dinner. Uh, it's interesting, perhaps, to to note the the different approach that Juventus are taking in uh, finding these three players to the one that they took to Chris, a certain Cristiano Ronaldo, who went to a nice lodge, uh, a ski resort with uh, all of his family and uh, a few friends. Um, just yeah, I, I'm just going to leave that out there. Because I, I, I find it interesting. Say, it's funny to see the different approach that they take to having dinner with 20 people. <laughs> that might be interesting as well. <laughs> Some people are reporting it was only 10 people. So, you know, it's still quite a big dinner party, but not 20. Fair enough. Anyway, the, the effect that this has on the league is that they're likely to be left out of the Turin derby this weekend. For a start, it has to be said this is a largely a symbolic decision because uh, Arthur is injured and Dybala, is, as far as I'm aware, is not fully recovered yet from his previous injury. It's just McKinney who would theoretically be dropped and he's also he's played so many games he could probably do with a rest. Having said that, um, last time we spoke, Juventus uh, lost to Benevento, so I think um, it's imperative to get back to winning ways. Torino, as we keep mentioning, are in this crazy relegation fight and they'll battle for every single point they can get. So it um, could be an interesting one. Yeah, and to, uh, just to add to that fact, you already mentioned Bonucci being out earlier, Oscar, but also Demiral also uh, has tested positive for, for COVID is in, and is in isolation. So uh, that squad, the, 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 the biggest and richest in Serie A, is really, really looking depleted. And... It's old news now, right, that their title challenge is over. But the new news probably is that Napoli and Atalanta look bang in form. And perhaps that, that what we spoke about the last couple of weeks about Juventus's top four position potentially being at risk could actually uh, come to pass. We'll see. Yeah. Um, and while we're on the topic of Torino, uh, we can move on to the other scandal that we, we need to discuss that... Uh, there's a suggestion that Torino could sue Lazio's lawyer, who said that the decision to reschedule the game between the two clubs was a fraud. <laughs> Anyone want to take a risk on uh, commenting on that one, Baez? No comment. <laughs> I mean, it's just funny, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is funny. I agree chaos, chaos seems to be the, the the name of the the game. It's just that there are a lot of accusations flying out. Boaz mentioned self interest before. There are certain games that, that people want to play, people want postponed. Uh, it's never for like scientific reasons or or anything like that. I mean, I even read a complaint that the only reason that the Torino game got postponed was because there was a precedent set with the the Juve-Napoli game. And it's like, yeah, well, I mean, that's how courts and like like courts of arbitration work, surely. (laughs) No, it's like, if this rule applies in this instance, then the rule must apply in this instance as well. Um, So yeah, just more and more 
self-interest and um, yeah the, the for for Lazio to to be publicly taking this sort of a position against Torino when they've just faced uh, bans and fines of their own for uh, covid violations is um i think uh, on the nose is not the right phrase but it's a it's a bold it's a bold stance to take yeah um and you mentioned you mentioned the other the other scandal at Lazio this week yeah so there are allegations that Lazio doctors hid and misrepresented the information about the covid status of their players uh, some doctors have received bans the uh, chairman Latito's also received a seven month ban and a fairly hefty fine for this another difficult one for us to really comment on but um but has any thoughts the one thing that we should probably say is that it feels strange that at the very start of the season Roma were docked a point, a point because um, of a what was ostensibly a clerical error there was a, a player who was inserted in the under 21 list when he was over 21 but essentially it wouldn't have made a difference he was supposed to play either way and there was room for him still Roma lost a point from this whereas Lazio who clearly benefited from having some of their best players on the pitch in some um, strange scenarios I'm, I'm don't, I don't know exactly what happened but it could be that they were COVID positive it could not it might not be but in any case this was clearly the whole club was aware of this thing and yet there is no no points docked no just a just a fine and it's probably no surprise that Lazio w- won't appeal this decision because it, it seems to have benefited them a little bit. Yeah, I think we actually spoke about this at the time as well. So I don't think we need to be too too careful or or too sort of uh, meticulous in in detailing it. It was the it was the case of tests coming back from Lazio medic saying one thing and tests coming back from uh, UEFA and other medic saying saying other things, and it seemed very strange at, at the time. But uh, this is, yeah, this is the way the ruling has gone. And I, I totally, totally agree with Boaz. It's very strange, the sort of inconsistency in positions that um, have been taken in terms of, of punishments. A fine which, let's be honest, uh, when you're buying new planes for the club, uh, a, a fine of that size is not exactly going to uh, damage you too much, really. Um, whereas deduct point deductions, that's where it really hurts the clubs. And it's just interesting to see that the Lega City A feel that it's a, a bigger crime to have a clerical error than to completely try and allegedly completely try and <laughs> bypass this uh, the these sort of protocols. I, I the reason I'm treading so carefully, Kenny, is because Claudio Lotito is a regular listener, and I just want to keep him <laughs> on side. You know, I think Richard had a lot of love for them last week, so that's probably the reason for that. But as I know that you have been in touch with some uh, Serie A chairman on Twitter, I wasn't aware that Latito was one of them. Yeah, I have um, uh, friends in high places. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, while we're sort of broadly on the topic of COVID and COVID restrictions, um, what do we think of this news that um, VGC wants to reopen the Olympico for the Euro quarterfinals? I mean, obviously it would, would be great if it was possible, but what do we think about the way it's being handled, Kenny? So I don't think this is really, I, I don't really take an issue at all with uh, Fiji Chi on this, on this front. Uh, the issue I have is with UEFA. I mentioned to you, Oscar, before we, before we started recording, uh, it just seems crazy, this pressure that's being put on, on countries. So I'm in, I'm in Scotland and uh, we, in Scotland, we're, we're being told that if we couldn't guarantee by the end of March that we were going to be out of lockdown by the time the tournament started, that the games were going to be removed from from Scotland. And it's it's, it's a very similar situation in, in Italy. The thing is, if you want to have this tournament this year, and I think all football fans are in agreement that we do want to have it, not least because we've got the, the World Cup to look forward to next year and the, you know, the fixture list is already very congested. If you want to have it this year, why would you be why are they putting that sort of pressure on countries who have been in complete lock they've locked down their entire economies and yet you're trying to pressurize them into putting all of that at risk essentially for the sake of football look either go ahead and play it behind closed doors uh, if the if if it's needed um but you know with the intention of playing with 
30% capacity stadiums, 40% capacity stadiums, whatever it is. Um, and then, you know, if that isn't a reality, play it behind closed doors or you postpone the the tournament. I mean, this this whole thing of it will happen, sort of no matter what, come hell or high water, this tournament's going to happen. It's going to have fans in the stadiums and threatening countries and footballing associations with having games stripped from them if that doesn't happen. I mean... I'm a, I, I'm a diehard football fan, uh, which is the reason that obviously I, I, I'm on a podcast with you guys. Um, but I mean, even I realize that football, you know, when it comes to matters of life and death, football has to take kind of a back uh, a back seat in in these things. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't want to end up in a situation where you give all the games to the country that's willing to take the most risks. It just makes no sense. Yeah. Precisely. I mean, if, if it's on the basis of vaccinations, and I'm not saying this because I'm in the UK, because uh, God knows there have been many things that have happened that have been a disaster uh, in, in the UK over the, the last year. Um, but if you decide to give it to the UK because they've had high vaccinations, or even Israel, where Boaz is, cause, where they have even higher uh, vaccinations, then that's one thing. But putting pressure on countries that are about to enter a third wave, or that are in the process of entering a third wave of this global deadly pandemic seems uh, really grim. I've just realised this is how um, Boris Johnson wins another term, isn't it? He brings football home with a vaccination programme. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> April okay. Fool's. Um, April Fool's. <laughs> uh, okay, we should just uh, briefly kind of talk about the games that are going on this weekend. Uh, we already mentioned that Roma playing Sassuolo is probably kind of the pick of the weekend in terms of uh, closest positions in the table. Kambule is injured. He's out for four weeks, so definitely going to be this, missing this game. Likely to also miss the uh, clash with Atalanta uh, late in April that we'd have highlighted before is probably key to the top four. Kenny, you mentioned that the uh, COVID outbreak is also affecting Sassuolo as some of their players that were away on national international duty have tested positive or it's just precautionary? No, it's precautionary. It's Sassuolo have taken the, the decision to to keep them out of the, the team to avoid so, an outbreak. Uh, so actually an honourable to them. Could we give them an honourable for taking that, taking that decision? I'll speak to the, the people who maintain the table. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we're saying that all the other teams sort of in the race for the top four are playing a uh, lower half opposition, or well, from 10th place downwards. Milan have Sampdoria, Atlanta, Udinese, Napoli have got Crotone, Sassuolo, Roma, Lazio play Spezia. Yeah, we've spoken about the Turin derby and then um, Inter away at Bologna. Yeah, that um, Udinese game could be a potential banana skin for Atalanta, so that would be uh, very interesting. Uh, Udinese have proven difficult opposition for, for numerous teams, uh, including Inter, who are running away with it at the moment. So don't, by any means, just uh, assume that that's three points. At no, at definitely. Atalanta. I mean, I think there are a few potential banana skins in there, especially with players being certain players being out. So yeah, we'll we'll look forward to discussing those next week. We should move on because we've still got our Scudetto to get through. Shall we quickly do good week, bad week? Yeah, it's kind of a weird week to do it because there there weren't that many teams. <laughs> but I guess we can go international for a change. Yeah, well, I guess do we just give good week to the national team? They won all three of their games. This week it makes sense. Yeah, bad week to the under twenty ones for all of their red cards. <laughs> or to La- I, mean, I mean, but, Lazio but they qualified, right? They did qualify. Lazio, I think, have had a worse week than the uh, Italy under twenty ones. Have we given Lazio a bad week before? I bet we have, but I'm happy to do it again. Well, they got some praise last week from Richard, some warranted praise for for their play style. And he's a former um, pro, so he, so his opinion counts more than ours. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll just weigh into them this this week. We'll just yeah, make up for week. it. Sorry, lads, you've had a bad week. <laughs> um, okay, it's time for our Scudetto. So let's start with a question from Milan Obsession. So the Lazio doctors were banned after the COVID-19 testing scandal. Letizia got a seven-month ban too. Do you think it was regarding the testing issues or was it because he compared COVID-19 to the bacteria in women's vaginas? <laughs> <laughs> uh... Could be a bit of both. Such a crazy season that um, that this quote from Lotito is, feels like it was decades ago, but it was some it was at the begin- towards the beginning of the season in any case. So genius, um, 
to- this is the guy, one of the guys who is negotiating the TV deal we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I don't think we have a good answer. Do we? Do we I mean, yeah. <laughs> cool. It, it uh, should. It should be. It should be for both of them. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we've got another question. Maybe oh, we maybe can't answer this one either. But yeah, we can. also from Milan Obsession. The clubs of players who are injured on international duty can receive compensation from FIFA. Should FIFA also compensate them for the games that they miss when they contract COVID on international duty? Interesting one. I mean, it's not, it's not one we've looked, we've researched too much, but uh, I think if uh, COVID continues to be a reality in, in our world, then obviously FIFA needs to take it into consideration. It wasn't so long ago that uh, FIFA didn't compensate uh, national teams, I mean, player didn't compensate clubs when they, their players were injured on international duty. So if uh, FIFA can change there, what, what COVID is just a val- as valid a reason. I guess it probably depends like I was just going to say the current insurance is it only for injuries sustained while playing or could it be like on the plane or in the training ground because you never know where they've contracted COVID yeah I mean I think I think yes it should be I think yes it should be especially if these uh, supranational uh, bodies are putting pressure on you know authorities to you know have these games going ahead and Crowds, as we've discussed that as i ranted about earlier yeah i mean why not i mean you can yeah sure sure it's the same thing right i mean it's not like the national teams are responsible for people getting injured just like they're not responsible for people contracting covid i mean i i, I don't even know that i i feel that they should be compensated for players getting injured on national duty it's just one of those things but if they are compensated for for that which they are we know uh then why shouldn't they be for for contracting covid kind of makes sense to me fair enough um so in conclusion we don't know uh in conclusion i say yes they should be i'm all for it (laughs) all right i won't stand against you uh so we've also couple of questions one each for you from viola club israel uh kenny which would you rather you have to watch the first german tier exclusively for half a decade or atalanta switch with atlanta united fc for one season <laughs> this is a great question uh right okay so uh first of all i i have to say that i don't watch third german tier football but I can say that I watch uh, Scottish top tier football on a semi regular uh, occasion, uh, and I'm quite quite happy to do that. So I mean, I, d- I don't really have a problem with either of these, but I quite like the idea of the MLS becoming uh, as it is becoming sort of more prominent and having like the US take on uh, on this this beautiful game. So I'm I'm happy to go for Atlanta come, United. Come on, or are they really awful? Are they really awful at Atlanta FC? Yeah, are they but like the worst team in the MLS or something. They won. The... Atlanta could get a title. Though. Exactly. They they won. I think they did well a couple of years ago, and then they brought in um, the Burr, and obviously we know how oh, that goes. Right. That's but, that story. Uh, but uh, Kenny, it's a no-brainer. Like, the, it, can you imagine the Americans seeing Gasperini play and like Zapata and Gosens and all these guys in the, in the MLS? And everyone's like, "Whoa, look at Gosens go!" Like, it's perfect. <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'm I'm all for the the MLS. I think it's great that um, the the US is has embraced over the last sort of twenty thirty years uh, football, and I'm I'm all for it. I think it would be great. We'll yeah. send you over there to cover it. So. I'm happy to do that as well. Boaz, your question from the Viola Club Israel is, uh, what is the best Israeli beer? It's a it's a hard one. I think the best Israeli beer I ever had was one called Cruzo, which was a mango IPA. I only had it once and I couldn't find it ever again. So I, I might have imagined how good it was. Of my regular beers, I think there's a beer called uh, The Ugly Beer from a brewery called Ronen, which I'm a big fan of and I try to get whenever I see it. That's a pretty good answer. Uh, I've got another question for you. For you, it's from. Uh, Sorry, there's one more question from Viola Club. I don't know if you. I think he's asking you. If he's asking you to be his shrink, so go for it, Oscar. Okay. So if if we won the Serie B championship and it counts for a trophy, why shouldn't I support my team going down each season? I mean, you can. I'm I'm not necessarily against that. If it if it means you have a nicer life watching your team, then fair enough. This, the problem is once you get a taste of glory. You have to sustain it, and it's it's just not going to be enough. 
but go ahead, support your team to get relegated. <laughs> so I'm not sure what else to say. I would say I would say that um, yeah, don't 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 go ahead. You want to see your team match up against the best out there. So yeah, that's that's the glory of watching Atalanta in the Champions League when you know that they're unlikely to beat teams like Real Madrid and PSG. It's seeing them match up. So, yeah, see, it feels strange to be talking to a Fiorentina fan like this because Fiorentina have always been one of the, the big clubs. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, take consolation from me. I've supported St. Mirren, uh, Atalanta and Tottenham Hotspur who until recently were uh, not the most fun to watch either. I would kind of, I reckon I would take Spurs going down into the championship, especially if they like appointed a fun, exciting manager. I'd much prefer that. Like uh, Bielsa. Yeah. The problem is, if you go down, you, it's not sure that you'll go back up. So um, I'd, I just, I'd just rather stick around in the top league and sometimes do well, sometimes not do as well, but, you know, just be, be part of the elite. I'm also not sure that uh, Serie B Championship counts as an honour. Uh, I don't know that that really is the, is the case. You don't get stars on your shirt for winning Serie B. Unless you're Spezia and they, they just have random badges from all sorts of random... <laughs> yeah, fair point, fair point. Next question. Um... Okay, so the next question is for you as well, Buzz. Um, from Sharky, Sharky Viney, I guess it is. I don't think that's the real name. But um, is Belotti the striker that Milan needs somewhere? It's kind of a two-part question. Is Belotti the best striker out there in the world right now? Probably not. Far from it. But considering Milan have not been in the Champions League for several years and considering budgets as a whole are quite low, Belotti certainly fits the profile of a kind of player that would improve the Milan squad and would be that um, that goal-scoring poacher that I've been saying all season that Milan really need. However, his age might be a, a slight question mark. He's 28 and Milan have been linked to him for at least three seasons. If it continues like this, he'll be in his 30s by the time he gets to Milan. Fair enough. I think there was a, a more succinct answer posted by another of our fans on uh, Twitter, so you can go and check that out. <laughs> If you want an alternate perspective. So we've got a question from Sigmund. I don't like the way Sigmund starts this one off because he says, listening to Serie A chat on various pods. I don't know what he's playing out there. <laughs> um, but he gets the impression that everyone loves Papu Gomez. There is only uh, one well, Serie A pod to do yeah, them all. Yeah, exactly. Um, but why does this podcast love Papu Gomez, Kenny? Oh my God. I mean, Papu Gomez is incredible. I... I, I genuinely was quite distraught when they fell out with Gasp and ended up uh, ended up leaving he's just he's just a wonderful footballer I mean he's the reason that kids watch football he scores glorious goals he works his socks off he's got incredible technique he's he manages to have like a huge presence in the field despite being a, a, a tiny character. He's just bags of energy I mean I could go on I could go on I, I would say a better question is um, why wouldn't any anyone love Papu Gomez? He's glorious. There you go, Sigmund. Just try getting that kind of analysis on one of your other pods. Good answer, Kelly. Okay, but as you can take his other question, which is Danish players have been a regular fixture in Serie A since the 1948 Olympics. Do you have any memories of Danes in Serie A? I think the, the biggest name that comes to mind is probably Laudrup which uh, Kenny mentioned in our pre-production meeting, but um, I'm probably slightly too young to remember his time in Italy. Um, if I'm to wear slightly red and black tinged glasses for a minute, the guy who stands out the most for me is John Dahl Thomason, just because uh, his arrival coincided with a really fantastic era for Milan and for the Italian game. He was there when Milan lifted some very important trophies. Another one that's worth mentioning is Thomas Helwig, who arrived from Udinese and with uh, Zaccheroni and Birov and lifted the, the unlikely title in 99. He also went to Inter towards the end of his career, I think as part of one of these crazy swaps that was happening in that period. In any case, worth mentioning. Okay, this is one that you can both answer uh, from Jimble. What Italian stadium that you haven't visited before would you want to attend post-COVID? And likewise, what is the worst stadium that you've ever visited in Italy? So the stadium that I would want to, to visit the most that I've never been to would be the Dallara uh, in Bologna. I'd love to visit it before redevelopment and uh, really, really love to, to, to visit it afterwards. It's just, it's such a unique 
such a unique stadium. I remember it from way back when Italian Novanta was was happening. Uh, I had I had that, this this book with all of the stadiums in it. I don't know why. I'm an absolute geek. I kept this book. I think I've still got it in a box somewhere with all of the plans for all of the stadiums. And it was just always one that just stuck out uh, of being just like really beautiful. That mixture of the sort of modern and the old is something that I really, really love. And I have to say the plans look really, really exciting. So I'd love to go and visit it. Um, I'd love to go and visit it once it's um, once it's redeveloped. And the worst stadium, it's kind of difficult because I've actually only been to three stadiums um, in, in Italy. I was 16 when I left, so I had to go to the ones that my dad would uh, either take me to or the ones that uh, I could get to easily with my mates on public transport. Um, so I went to, to Genova to the Luigi Ferraris. Uh, which is an incredible stadium. Um, I went to what was then the Atleti Azzurri d'Italia, which is now the uh, Jevis uh, Stadium, which was a bit ramshackle back in the days, but just the setting is absolutely incredible. And it it's the redevelopment that's going on there is incredible. And San Siro, and uh, like no one can have a bad word to say about San Siro if you've ever been there. So I haven't been to, to, to a bad stadium out of those three, but I did play at the Danilo Martelli Municipal Stadium of uh, Mantua, uh, which has a cycling, like a... a <laughs> velodrome type thing around it which is really really weird um, because it's got this really weird incline incline sorry um, and I was very very excited to be going and playing in, in a stadium as any kid would be even though it was empty but that stadium was just a bit weird it was like playing in a huge like bowl it was weird so that's the worst stadium I've ever been to out of four okay uh, you sort of sort of dodged that one maybe should have made you pick the least favorite of the, the free top flight one. We'll let Baz have a go. For me, the the stadiums I would like to visit that I haven't visited yet are um, the Diego Armando Maradona in Naples and the Ferraris in Genova, which uh, Kenny just mentioned. Both probably just for the atmosphere and obviously I'd, I'd want to go when it's uh, full. Uh, with regards to the worst stadiums I've ever been to, there's a few, but the one I have to highlight is the Dele Alpi. Uh, Juve's former stadium. It it just had terrible sound. the The wind was blowing through it. It was uh, really horrible to get to, and uh, fans were s- segregated in weird ways. But a fun tale from my time at the Alpi was that I w- I went to the ch- a Champions League game between Liverpool and uh, Juventus uh, in the season that Liverpool en- went on to beat Milan, unfortunately. But in any case. Um, and some dopey policeman was playing around with his uh, tear gas canister throughout the whole first half and just chucking it between his hands. And this guy dropped it. And I, w- I was sat in the family stand. And next thing I know, there, there's gas everywhere and people are scrambling. And I found myself like in the parking lot outside the stadium. I don't know how I got there. But anyway, I missed a good 20 minutes of that game <laughs> thanks to this dopey guy. <sighs> it's a good story. Um, and good speaking story. of good stories, Ken, we've got a question here. What happened to your story about Sassuolo Stadium? Oh, how much detail do do we want to go into? Yeah, Sassuolo are a great we want club. A lot of detail. Maybe if you don't not, have time to tell it now, we can. Not a lot. Okay, it. so quite. We've teased quite... this like four times now. <laughs> <laughs> the, the very, the very, very uh, brief version of this is that Sassuolo is a, a great club. They play great football. They've got a lovely ethos, except for the fact that they stole the stadium off of Regina uh, and Regina crowdfunded it. So lots of people <laughs> bought like lifetime season tickets and then it got nicked by Sassuolo because Regina went uh, went bust. So yeah, there we go. So did they t- keep the season tickets? Or? I don't know. I imagine not. <laughs> I imagine if you're one of those season ticket holders, you're <laughs> pretty change. pissed off right now. <laughs> Just change allegiances. Yeah, that's the short version. Okay, well, maybe we'll have the long version next week. Um, we need to move on to the honourables and dishonourables and sticking with stadiums for a second. Bologna have sorted theirs out, haven't they, Kenny? Yeah, so we, we spoke about uh, Roma's stadium uh, falling through a couple of weeks ago. We've spoken about... Fiorentina, uh, Comiso, with his uh, objections to, to the 
bureaucracy in Florence. Uh, but this is a good story. This is a good stadium story from Italy. Uh, Bologna, so they're on the on the road to, to getting the Dallara redeveloped, uh, as I briefly mentioned earlier. They've appointed uh, people to to design a temporary stadium. Plan is for them to move into that uh, in the summer of 2022. And then within two years to have the Dallara looking redeveloped, uh, modern and really, really great. So this is really, really positive news on that front for Italian football. Good stuff. Um, a less positive redesign. I have to give <laughs> a, a dishonourable to the new Inter Milan badge. It looks a bit like... I don't know. It looks a bit like a car brand badge, I think. And I liked the old badge. I'm not really sure what the need to redesign was. Also, I've been doing the rounds on Twitter that it looks a little bit like it says tit. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Who told you that? I didn't realise you were actually going to... Yeah. Gonna, we can gonna... share the uh, graphical illustration that, that highlights that. But oh, I just think it's worth mentioning and it's a definite <laughs> dishonourable. <laughs> That's so unbelievable. Okay, I've brought the tone down. Kenny, it's up to you to bring it back up with uh, okay. a honourable. Men- yeah, honourable mention for Rafael Toloi on his Italy debut. Um, he obviously just recently took up Italian citizenship. Uh, he had a really nice quote after the after the game as well, saying. Um, that, you know, at his age, he you know he wasn't going to get that many chances and was just really happy to to have the the opportunity to play at uh, hopefully an international tournament. And I think looking at the back three that Mancini plays, the system that he plays, the system that Atalanta play, the seasons that um, certain centre backs, uh, Romagnoli, one of them and uh, probably Acerbi, uh, another one, have had. Um, you wouldn't count against him possibly making his way into that Italy squad. Uh, Honourable mention for him. And a good performance as well. Good stuff. Um, and Boaz, you've got Kenny's goals honourable this week. Yeah, we're, just, goals s- honorable. we're switching it up a little bit. Don't, don't, uh, don't lose your heads. But uh, I'd like to give an honourable to Goran Pandev, who scored uh, the, a goal against Germany in uh, North Macedonia's win. Obviously, we'd, we'd already given him uh, honourable for scoring right at the start of the season and again for qualifying Macedonia. And this is just a continuation of this dream. And he famously quoted the 90s R&B singer Gabriel after the game by saying the dreams do come true. And um, <laughs> this kind of gives me a good opportunity to, again, slightly fall out of my remit. But, um, I mean, Timo Werner was really... He, saw, he heard that we had the Living La Vida Loca challenge and he's like... A, I might not win any trophies this year, but this seems like something that's achievable. <laughs> and so he, his miss was something else. And uh, well done. You're, you've got yourself at least on the podium. And on the topic of Bologna, Kenny, you've got another honourable in that area. Yeah, bit Bologna heavy, the honourable mentions. But I couldn't let this week uh, go by without giving an honourable mention to uh, Sinisa Mihailovic and young Bologna supporter Tommaso, who squared off... Uh, this is basically a video that the Bologna social media team put out with this this little kid, um, basically just showcasing his uh, his skills to to Mister Mihailovic, basically k- having a, a go to uh, getting a football into uh, into a, a basketball ring. He has a few goes with his uh, left foot, and on the third attempt, manages to get it in. Uh, the reason this is an honourable mention is because Mihailovic. You know, obviously loves a, a competition, and he responded on uh, Bologna social media by saying, "This week you've picked the wrong guy to challenge, kid. Uh, <laughs> let, this is the ball, and this is the basket. Let's see how many ch- times it takes me to get the ball into the basket." And then, obviously, pings with his beautiful left foot the the, the ball into the basket. Allegedly, first attempt. I mean, there's a bit of a cut, so we don't really know. And you just hear him celebrating wildly. And then he goes, you see, I don't need three attempts. I only need one. (laughs) 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 But it's great. Yeah, really, really good. Honorable mention for Sinisa Mihailovic and for Tommaso, Bologna fan. I think he's 11 years old. Yeah, it's like a a better natured Michael Owen video. Excellent. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Nice one. He's only 11 years old. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Vaz, you want to finish us off with a dishonorable? This actually happened uh, towards the end of last week, but um, it, we didn't have time to fit it into the last episode, but I think it's worth mentioning. Pavel Nedved, Juventus great and current vice president, 
had an interview with uh, the previously mentioned The Zone, in which he mentioned that uh, his son was in the in high school when Juve started winning titles, and now he's about to graduate from university, and uh, Juventus are still the reigning champions. To which uh, Inter legend and Italy 2006 World Cup legend uh, Marco Materazzi was quick to respond. My, my children got to see me win a, a, a Champions League and a World Cup by the time they were in kindergarten. Uh, hopefully your son will someday get to see these too. Oof. So it's nice to see that these grown men are, have managed uh, <laughs> y- years after they've stopped playing to still keep their petty rivalry going. Chapeau. Love to see it. We should get them on this podcast. They're listeners. <laughs> They're both keen <laughs> listeners. And we are actually mediating between them right now. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff right well thanks very much guys that is all we've got time for this week if you don't already please do subscribe to our podcast on apple Podcasts or spotify or wherever you get your audio we'll speak to you next week until then enjoy the football <laughs> Juventus <laughs> campione d'Italia questa data il 6 maggio